not used to doing this without presentation in front of me, so forgive me if this doesn't work too well. Um, but what I do is highly visual, and so it wouldn't really make a lot of sense without, without some of the stuff behind me. Um, yeah, like Kat said, um, probably a lot of what you've heard in the last few hours has been largely about writing, and, but journalism increasingly, especially online, is increasingly visual, and um, the world is awash with data, loosely defined, not just statistics. Anything that can be organized in a, in a systematic way is data that can be turned into something interesting online. We heard in the last presentation that stats are boring. If they're not presented effectively, I would agree with that to a point. And I think that's why it's important that we develop the skills to present them in an intelligent manner and in a visual manner. And that's what I'm going to get into here a little bit today. And of course, it's not working. Right. Ooh. Here's the details. If you want to follow, find any of these um, slides, they're at the URL at the bottom. Um, that should be working. I asked for it to be set up before I left the office, but I, it may not work. It will definitely work later today. Um, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to contact me. So I am the head of something called the interactive news team at the FT. Um, what that means is we are sort of three groups of people that news organizations have always kind of had but didn't really use very effectively until quite recently. One is what we're calling computer-assisted reporters, so often uh, journalists from an investigative bent who, who uh, are very skilled with using data analysis to find stories. Second is data visualization specialists. These people generally exist in news organizations, usually in graphics departments, right? People who know all about the theory and practice of how to produce charts and graphics and so on. And then finally, developers, web developers. Um, most news organizations have pretty big engineering teams just keeping their websites running. But they've often not sat in the newsroom producing content, producing news. And what happens when you bring those three groups of people who news organizations have always had together to, do, to work together on, on stories rather than on the infrastructure of the site, you can start doing really interesting things. Generically, we, often people talk about interactive graphics. I think that's a, that's a limiting term. We prefer to talk about news apps as a more general uh, phrase for what it is we do. And a news app is basically a piece of software that takes some input, does something to it, and spits out something else. And that, that input can be anything from a spreadsheet that you've got from a government website, or in your case, from your university administration. You've filed a Freedom of Information Act request. You've done something to get some exclusive source of data. Or there may be public data that's out on APIs or out on the web that you can grab in a, some sort of systematic way, do something to, to find a story, and then present it in an interesting way, all programmatically using software. Oh. Give you some examples of the sort of things we work on. This is a investigation that we supported um, about the share price of a a uh, Hong Kong listed company called Hanergy Thin Film, which for a while the, the principal shareholder in this was the richest man in China. And we discovered through analyzing hundreds of thousands of individual trades on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange that most of the, um, uh, most of the, the growth in the price of this stock it was happening in the last 10 minutes of trading, which is a, a highly unusual pattern that aroused all sorts of suspicions among the regulator in Hong Kong. Or we might have produced an app to get election results as they happened. The Press Association puts out a, an API of election results. It's hugely complex. It has every piece of information of, uh, from the elections as they are from every count. They have a reporter on the ground everywhere. They put this out in a sort of machine-readable form. And instead of sitting there fr frantically typing results in, we built an application ahead of time so that as these results trickled in through this, this data feed, um, we had live updating results on our website throughout the night of the, election, of the general election count. And you could also, this is also quite important to this, um, this approach to journalism allows you to give readers the opportunity to drill down into the data and find the, the local aspect of a national story that's interesting to them. In, in ele and elections are a classic example of this because while most people care about the general overall result, they also care about a result um, where they live. And so this, this, if you would look at this on a mobile phone, it would give you the result both nationally and in your constituency. 
or some, I, I wish I could show you this. This is a sort of big multimedia story. Um, you see these more and more uh, big feature stories, long form written journalism, but, but also combined with audio and video and work built in a way that works entirely perfectly on mobile devices as well. More than half of uh, news websites audiences now are on mobile phones. So if you produce things like this that don't work on mobile devices, they just don't work. Most of your audience can't see them. So there's absolutely no point building any of this sort of stuff unless it works on, on mobile phones as well. And, and long, long text like this, long text is particularly difficult because you know, people don't want to scroll all day. L reading this beautiful, long, well-researched piece of journalism, they want to see all the pictures, they want to see all the video, they want to listen to the podcast that went along with it, and they want to do it all in one place, not through a bunch of links to seven different services. They want it all in one elegantly designed thing, just like we used to design magazine pages very carefully, now we have to design web pages really carefully. And that requires really specialist skills. Maps, maps are another thing. People don't generally think of maps as data, but they are, they're visualizations of, of geographical data. And if you're doing a geography degree, you know all about this. Um, this is a, a map of the London Fire Brigade's response times down to a 100 square meter radius, uh, or, or uh, within a 100 square meter uh, grid, which we established by analyzing data that we obtained under the Freedom of Information Act. Um, or you can, you can start doing games, you know, if you take a complex thing like the budget, how, do you, how, do you, how does the Chancellor of the Exchequer um, balance the British national budget? Or how does uh, the BBC work out how to reduce its services um, in line with, with the funding that it's going to lose? I mean, th this is a really difficult thing, and it's really hard to explain in text, but if you create a little game that make people put people in the position of the decision maker and saying these are the trade-offs that people are having to make, and here are the tough decisions that we are asking politicians or leaders of large public entities like the BBC to make, um, this will help people understand these stories much better. And, hang on. This isn't working. So we're not alone in this. The, a lot of news organizations have teams that do something like this. They all call them slightly different things. Um, the BBC has a large operation called uh, BBC Visual Journalism. Um, the Guardian has a thing called Guardian Visuals. Um, the Times has a data team. They have a slightly different focus, much more on the research side rather than on the visual output side. And BuzzFeed has something that they call uh, New Formats, um, which essentially is the same thing as well. And why do news organizations do this? Because it works. The single most read story on the BBC News website in 2013 was this. Oops. Oops. God, this is a really sensitive. Hey, there we go. Um, this, this was a quiz um, built by their visual journalism team that took some academic research from, I think, the LSE and um, gave readers the opportunity to drill down into this academic research into what does um, social class mean in Britain today uh, and, and allowed them to position themselves, allowed readers to position themselves within it. It's a classic case of the personalization that I was talking about earlier. And this was the single most read thing uh, on their website in 2013. It, um, I think it got six million page views the first day it was published. Um, Similarly, the same year, the New York Times did this, which is a, also based on an academic piece of research about how North American dialects are different. You know, here in Britain, we talk, everybody knows kind of how different parts of the country sound a little bit different in the way they talk. In the US, this isn't as well known, but it's obviously just as pronounced. And so the New York Times made this map um, where you could answer a series of questions about how you pronounce certain words, and it would use, the, uh, use an algorithm to work out, based on your responses, where you grew up. And it was uncannily accurate, because it was based on this very extensive research that a group of statisticians at Harvard had done. This was um, the single most read story in the New York Times in 2013, even though it was published on December 30th. Um, it got 20 million page views and was also the fourth most read story last year. So these things work. And it's also interesting how they come about. Some of the skills that you probably are learning through your degrees, but are, haven't really been told are applicable to journalism, are exactly what's needed to do this kind of work. So that New York Times map, 
was produced by a guy called Josh Katz, who was a PhD student at, uh, I think, the University of South Carolina. He was a statistics student, and um, they brought him in as a, uh, brought him in on work experience. So the guy on work experience built the single most popular thing the New York Times has ever done, and um, he, he kind of never thought of himself as a journalist. He never realized that the skills that he has are applicable to journalism. Um, and oh, this thing is really annoying. So you know, he, he, he was interviewed a few days later after this, uh, after this thing was published, and you know, he said that he always kind of liked doing this stuff as part of his degree, but he'd never realized that this is what journalists do as well, specifically journalists who do this kind of new type of visual data-driven journalism. He now works for them full-time. The, there's this long tradition of people doing this kind of work. It's only recently become sort of interactive online, but there's this long tradition of uh, data-driven journalism that goes back at least half a century. If you, if you kind of go, if you delve into the history, we talk about data journalism today like it's some newfangled idea, but actually this is well-established practice. Um, and I think uh, Steve Doig, the guy who said this, um, he's actually a Pulitzer Prize winner in the US. There's been several uh, very high profile stories in the US and is increasingly common here in Europe as well. Um, but I think this is a good summary of what we're trying to accomplish and what the best forms of data journalism are. Social science done on deadline. Taking the techniques and tools that you're probably learning every day in your degree and applying them to journalism. Hans Rosling, anybody here familiar with Hans Rosling? Swedish uh, um, public health researcher who's very famous for his TED talk where he does all sorts of floating bubbles and stuff a few years ago. This was really, you know, he, he, he kind of said the work he does is kind of similar. It's, it's you have to be like a tabloid in the front, but have really rigorous research underpinning it. You have to find a great way of showing your story visually, make it interesting, but have all the really hard stats perfectly working in the background as part of your software underlying it. Now here's the good news about all of this. Lots of news organizations want to get into doing this kind of work, but very few journalists have these skills. If you have even slight quantitative skills, you're often in uh, you know, the top 2% of journalists, of working journalists. People with lots of experience do not have the skills to do this. We recruit internally at the FT, mind you, right? at a place that's not exactly lacking in numerate journalists. We don't have a lot of journalists who write code. We don't have a lot of journalists who have taken those statistical skills that they have and have really thought about how to use them to find stories. So actually, students who are kind of coming to this fresh often have an advantage, and we tend to hire people um, relatively younger than we do for a lot of other jobs in this, in this space. So if you've done any website design, web development, you know how to write a little bit of front-end code, great. Anybody here? Anybody here write any front-end code? Yeah? Good one. See? Yeah? This person here has a huge competitive advantage over the rest of you in their job hunt. Anyone done uh, doing a design degree, know anything about user experience design? There's a, there's one, again, two. Anyone else? All right? You see, you see the sort of percentages we're talking about here? This is, these are real advantages in the job market. Stats. Anyone know some stats through their degree? Science students, anyone? Yeah, anyone social science degrees, economics? You probably know more stats than most journalists if your hand's up right now. Data visualization, anyone done any, making any charts using things like R? Nothing, no, yeah, a couple of hands, right? Put your hand up if any of this is on your CV. Do you recognize any of these terms and have them on your CV? These are the things we look for when we're hiring. These are not things that you hear about in journalism education. Brochures from journalism schools, they don't talk about this stuff. They think you know, you're know you gonna be a writer. No, you might be a coder sitting in the newsroom. That's okay, that's a different new form of journalism. And the good news is, as we see, some of you have these skills, right? They exist in computer science degrees, obviously. They do exist in almost all science degrees because you're gonna be writing some code to run your experiments. If you, like me, I have a sociology degree, 
I did one term of uh, required statistical methods for social science research. That is all my science, statistics background. But that, in, a, in, a, in the journalism world, that puts me in the upper 5% of knowledge of this space, right? So um, even if you have minimal knowledge from a degree that has some quantitative component, make the most of that in your research, in your applications for jobs. Really big one. Anyone here studying geography? Nobody, one. Okay, geography is a great degree for this stuff. Maps are data visualizations. Maps require knowledge of both a visual output and a, um, and a, and a rigorous statistical input. So especially if there's any GIS requirement in a, uh, that's geographical information systems, um, if that's a part of your geography degree, that's really interesting to us. Modern design degrees are also very good at this. You know, if you're doing a, if you're doing a fine art type degree or, or a information, uh, information design degree, today, most of those degrees will give you some of these skills as well. And there's also a handful of, of postgraduate courses now that you can do. Uh, Cardiff, City, and Goldsmiths all have specialist journalism degrees that are geared towards um, creating these skills. So if you haven't done this as an undergraduate, um, there are places where you can learn this formally. And, but don't, you know, for the 90% of you who didn't raise your hands at any of these questions, don't despair. Um, we can teach you this. You can learn this on the job. In fact, the single most important skill that we're looking for is the ability to keep learning because this stuff is moving so fast. Everything that I did five years ago when I first started doing this kind of work, completely irrelevant today. We use different software. There are different constraints with mobile. Um, these are the degrees that people in my team have. No computer science, no statistics, no economics. We learn this stuff on the job. If you put your hands up, please check out. This is the self-interested plug part of my presentation. Um, we, we hire every year uh, three graduates on our graduate scheme. It's extremely competitive. We get about 500 applicants for three places. But here's the good news. One of those places is reserved for people with the skills I described earlier. So if you're one of the 5% or so who raised their hands at one point, you have a huge advantage over the other, three, uh, over the other two people who are going to get these jobs. Because we're looking for you not just for your writing ability, uh, but your ability to take those skills that you have from your degree and apply them to journalism. And that's kind of key. We get lots of applications from people who you know, are doing PhDs in physics or something but have never used their statistical noose to find a story or tell a story. If you haven't done that, it's kind of irrelevant. So if you're sitting on an economics degree and you haven't thought about how can I use my understanding of linear regression to um, do some analysis of census data and see how my university is affecting the local economy and the town that it's in, you're kind of wasting it. You know, you're not, you're, not, you're not showing me that you understand how this stuff is relevant to journalism. So we don't know quite yet when it's going to open. It's usually towards the end of the year. It's kind of aimed at final year students and postgraduates. So um, the deadline will be in January. This information is slightly out of date on here, but um, it, it will be updated shortly. Keep an eye on this. Uh, that is all I have, but please, uh, I'd like to see you some questions.